along for the uh, faith uh, fellowship uh, Sunday school class in Chattanooga, Tennessee at the Highland Park Baptist Church. Uh, there was a, a church of uh, about 12,000 people, and uh, the Sunday school class was where we found our, our sweet fellowship there and got to know a lot of people. Uh, Dr. Economitis, Johnny Economitis, was our, our teacher, our professor as well at the, at the college, and he was our teacher. And um, uh, we uh, learned to uh, love him and his wife and uh, really had what's called Faith Fellowship Sunday School class. We had a lot of good fellowship there. And uh, that was the theme song. We would, we would sing that song uh, every, every uh, time to start with. And um, uh, it, it was a, a real blessing uh, to us in those uh, college days. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 7 this morning, Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to cover actually the whole chapter briefly, touching on some things and looking at, at um, uh, understanding a little bit. Now, as, as we look at chapter 7, we're going to find out that it's going back in time uh, to give us an understanding of, of one of the visions and dreams that Daniel had. And it's actually going to parallel the same uh, uh, dream or vision that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had in, in chapter 2. And so the, the two go together. We had a, a, a four different elements in the, in the statue that started with gold and then came on down to the uh, shoulders as silver and then as uh, uh, iron and, and uh, brass and then iron and clay. In the um, image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, and Daniel gave the, the dream as well as the interpretation. And then uh, at the age of about 67, uh, in, in the uh, first part of the uh, Babylonian captivity, uh, Daniel also had this dream and vision of the four beasts. And uh, it really troubled him. It wasn't something, oh, yeah, I had a dream. I, I, I kind of had some dreams last night that troubled me, too. One of them had a snake in it, and it, that really bothered me. Uh, I just couldn't. It was in the corner of, of a room, and I just couldn't get away from it. And uh, it, you, you think, okay, if it's in the corner of the room, you just go uh, to the other side or, or, or leave or whatever. But, you know, in dreams, you can't do that. You, and so I, I had a... I, I had a dream last night uh, that uh, really bothered me. And so then, then when I did wake up, you know, I couldn't go right back to sleep. I was all, you know, in a notch, you know, all worried about everything. And it, I knew it wasn't true, but I, I honestly uh, took the covers and looked at my feet to make sure there wasn't a snake down there. I, I kid you not. I kid you not. I, I lifted the covers to make sure there wasn't a snake at the, at the foot of the bed, I, I, I tell you. So dreams can trouble you. Well, this dream troubled Daniel. And you go, you'll see why as we read uh, verses 1 through 8, which is actually the dream. And then we'll, we'll talk about the interpretation in just a little while. So uh, Daniel 7, starting at verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, uh, uh, this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he w wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each uh, different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, which is exactly what happened, it was suddenly, another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. And after uh, this I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. 
The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible, vivid, uh, over exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling in the residue of its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. <laughs> my, my, what a, what a dream. What a dream. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're, we're uh, Lord, thankful that, that Daniel went through this. And Lord, he not only gives us a dream, but Lord, we, we're given understanding, Lord, by other scriptures, by, by Daniel himself and the interpretation, as well as understanding, Lord, uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and especially when we come to the book of the Revelation, we understand uh, that all these things culminate together and are descriptive of, uh, of the things that are happening in our world that have happened and are happening now. And we're thankful that we have the opportunity to observe these things. Lord, it gives us peace. It gives us understanding. It gives us, Lord, a, uh, the ability, Lord, to process even what's going on today, Lord, without great anxiety. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. So the book of Daniel was, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is not written in chronological order. And so uh, chapters 7 through 12 are going to go back and give prophecy. And, uh, it's, and especially you come to chapter 9, it's going to tell about God's time clock and how that his, uh, his, uh, God has a different timing than we have. And uh, uh, he has ways of of uh, marking certain things and then other things uh, where there's a space of time, uh, there's a long period of time. And in fact, we're going to see that here when we come especially to the Roman Empire, uh, that it's, it's, a, it's a long drawn out thing. Uh, and even though the Roman Empire uh, was actually overthrown in the 5th century, but, but uh, still it kind of remains even today. Uh, in uh, various ways and, and will be revived as it's talked about here as well. And so uh, there's a, a lot of different things that we're going to look at and we're not going to try to give you a whole lot of detail but rather we're going to try to give you as the dream does kind of an overview. Now it's always been helpful to me in anything that I'm doing to get the big picture to get the overview, uh, even in putting together something and, you know, we don't ever read the directions unless we can't figure it out on our own. But uh, still, if you're looking at directions and all you see is the uh, page one and page two and the detail and the diagram and this, that, and the other, it still helps to look at the whole picture to kind of get it in your mind and understand. And that's the reason why I love the writings of... Uh, the Apostle John, especially the Gospel of John, uh, it gives you a good overview of things and uh, an understanding of why these things took place. So let's notice some things now. There were four world kingdoms described in chapter 2 from the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And there's four different beasts in Daniel's vision which also describe the same four world kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom, the Medo-Persian empire, the Grecian empire under Alexander the Great, and then finally the Roman empire, as we mentioned, which would be conquered in the 5th century, but at some future time will revive itself, in which 10 nations will lock arms politically, economically, and militarily, forming a revived or a one world government. We know from other scripture this will be the Antichrist will be the leader. He's the little horn that raises up between all the rest of them. And we know that this will take place during the seven year tribulation period. Many unusual uh, things and judgments will take place. 
Now, many of these things will lead people to uh, the, the different uh, events that happen. And uh, as we, we've mentioned before, just in passing about uh, the fact that uh, we've been in this pandemic now for a good while. At first, when it came up uh, uh, in the first of uh, last year, in the year 2020, we thought, okay, it'd be just a few months and it'll all be over with pretty much. But it's uh, lingered on and we're still wearing these masks and I, uh, you know, the little fibers in this mask, they just drive me crazy, you know. And uh, uh, now the mask has become a political thing one way or the other and this, that, and the other. And uh, I remember 26 years ago in our cancer support ministry, uh, we had a section in the back of the church in Pearland where I pastored and uh, people, cancer patients would come in and they would always be wearing masks. And in that day and time, a mask, it was a, a necessity for those that were going through cancer treatments and, and it was not anything political about it whatsoever. But now everything we do, whether it's a mask, whether it's an, uh, 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 the uh, shots that we take and uh, uh, all that, uh, uh, everything that we do, is now a political statement, you know? And so uh, we have to understand that uh, we're going to be confronted not only with uh, this pandemic, but uh, and then we had the, the hurricane, we had uh, the freeze, the big freeze, and all these different things. And, and uh, people uh, uh, kind of wonder, well, is God trying to get our attention? And of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> God's trying to get our attention. And then uh, we, we think about these things and the Bible says in the last days that there will be earthquakes and all these different uh, phenomenals in the, in the uh, uh, phenomenon in the, in the um, nature. Uh, also it talks about pestilence and the word pestilence means disease. So there's going to be uh, probably other diseases and uh, challenges that we're going to face. Even though I'm looking forward to the time to where uh, we can be through with COVID, we can be uh, through with a mask, and we can uh, hug one another and have a, a good old time, amen, together uh, with uh, not having to worry about social distancing and all this, that, and the other. But to notice how that uh, all these things that happen lead people to uh, call on the government to uh, solve our problems. And rightfully so, we, we look to them for answers, maybe in uh, different ways, uh, uh, try to uh, uh, solve some problems and these dilemmas. But think about it in, in regards to this, the fact that the circumstances and dilemmas and crises that we are facing in life will lead many people to trusting in the government for uh, answers. We've already looking now to the government for a, a, a check to come in the mail. Uh, and I don't mean the, the Social Security. I'm talking about all the stimulus checks and this, that, and the other. We're, we're looking to the government for answers. And so uh, Daniel's role now is to uh, uh, give a report upon uh, these things that will take place. And that alone will give us peace of mind it allows us to understand our times. He was not a political activist trying to overthrow the powers that be, even though we know that Daniel did practice uh, what we would maybe call some civil disobedience in the fact that he did not uh, uh, bow down and worship the king because that was breaking a commandment to God. And so he said, and of course the principle is that we should obey God rather than men. And so uh, we understand that and put everything in, in the right context here. Now let's briefly look at the scriptures before us and understand that it doesn't give every detail about the different time periods, but it gives us what we need. And uh, it gives us a under, uh, quite sufficient to give us understanding, to give us wisdom, so that we're proactive and not reactive. You know, I, I appreciate the fact that we can watch the news and know what's going on and, and begin to show some wisdom about some things. But at the same time, uh, it, it's an understanding of, of reading the Bible 
and then looking at the news and what's going on and saying, okay, this, this is what's going on, this is what's happening, and asking God for wisdom. And notice now, first of all, in Daniel's uh, dream or vision, there was the four winds. Now, you can make a lot about this, but the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, it says in verse 2. Now, there are four winds and there's four beasts. Now, the four winds are found 23 different times in the Bible. It's used in Daniel chapter 8, and we'll get to that uh, probably next week, and also chapter 11, encompassing the four directions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. And I think it's kind of plain. You just go to each one of the references in the Bible to where the four winds are mentioned, and you kind of begin to get a picture. He's talking about the overall sense, north, south, east, and west, the four winds. But notice all four of these winds were blowing at the same time on the great sea. And so it uh, pictures turmoil. Also, we find that uh, uh, there's, um, the, the winds also mean spirits, referring to angels. And so God is uh, stirring up some things here, uh, showing uh, uh, that they're in... In the midst of chaos, there is God's, God is uh, in control. God knows what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 uh, talks about the four angels and the four corners of the earth. It says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not, uh, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And so that's in, in, uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 7. And then it talks about the great sea. In the Bible, the great sea is always referring to the Mediterranean Sea, which is the center of all that happens on the earth. And so it's not necessarily talking about uh, the sea as the, the geography of it itself or the location of it, but, but it's meaning the fact that it's so central to the whole earth. Uh, whether we realize it or not, uh, everything that happens on this earth, uh, the, it's all really centered around what's going on in the Mediterranean, in, in the east. And so we begin to see that uh, these four winds, it's very significant uh, uh, that it's blowing on the great sea. And uh, notice then, we will get to the four beasts and the ten horns in just a minute. But notice then, we're going to skip down to verses 9 through 12, uh, the vision of the Ancient of Days, because this is really where we need to understand. A lot of people will get into Bible prophecy, and they get bogged down in the events and the uh, symbolism and all that's going on and, and even timelines and things like that. And I want to just give you a warning at this point. And that is even tonight in looking at these uh, 25 different signs of the times, uh, we understand that uh, uh, we can look and see current events. We can see things lining up. And in our minds, we're thinking, okay, uh, Christ is going to return just any day now, and he very well could and probably will. <laughs> Amen. But you never know. Because I remember in the 70s, you know, we had these long lines of the gas, uh, trying to get gas. The, the uh, interest rates were sky high. The Cold War was uh, at, a, at a height. The, and everybody was uh, talking about Russia, you know, and uh, the, how that, uh, uh, it was going to take over. And, and uh, they were all worried about the religion of, of Romanism and this, that, and the other. And everybody was just on pins and needles. And, and so it was a big surge of, of preaching and teaching about the end times in that day. And uh, uh, some people really majored on that. That's all their whole ministry majored on. And, uh, and they had some that wrote books and, and predicted uh, the coming of Christ, you know, and then they, they looked at Israel and uh, coming back into the land. So they begin to count, you know, a generation. Well, that's got to be 40 years. So uh, we, it's got to be within this 40-year period and, and uh, 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 getting people all uh, stirred up and excited about the second coming of the Lord. And uh, th there's nothing wrong with being excited about the coming of the Lord. 
I believe the Bible teaches that in the New Testament. But uh, uh, we, we can't set a timeline. Remember, one of the, uh, there are several things that uh, cautions in the New Testament. One of them is the, that no one knows the day nor the hour. Then uh, there were some people that tried to take that in a literal meaning and saying, okay, if you don't know the day nor the hour, then that doesn't mean you don't know the month <laughs> or the year. <laughs> no, you don't know the day nor the hour. Let's just take it what it says. And then there's another aspect of things, the fact that, that uh, uh, so, some were, were saying, you know, well, uh, it, it's, it's got to happen within a, a certain period of time because of, you know, uh, the, the wrath of God is just, can't, God can't put up with this any longer. Well, think about it. When the days of Noah, uh, uh, God said, to my spirit shall not always strive with man. And he gave Noah the warning about uh, impending judgment, but guess what? It was what? A hundred and twenty years. Amen. A hundred and twenty years. Now, that, before, before all this took place, and God said it was going to happen, and, and it did happen, but it was a hundred and twenty years in waiting, and so he said, my, my spirit shall not always strive with men, and uh, it was a hundred and twenty years. So, so just a word of caution here. Uh, we don't know uh, how long God's mercy is and his grace and, and his uh, ability to uh, withhold his judgment for a while. Uh, we don't know. And so uh, it's, it's wrong, it's sinful, it's uh, absolutely wrong for us to try to speculate, set dates, or, or even a, a time frame and think, of, okay, God's got to come, you know, in the next uh, uh, few months or a few years. We don't know. We don't know. And so notice then, uh, we come to this vision of the Ancient of Days. Now, the main point is I want to make here is instead of getting hung up on events and uh, upon a timeline and upon the uh, uh, different things that's going to happen, uh, let's, uh, the details, let's talk about the Lord Jesus. This is the main thing. In Daniel's vision and in the book of the Revelation, and uh, I, I've seen this happen as well. Um, that is, uh, people would be teaching in the book of the Revelation and, and they would be talking about all these different things that were going to take place. And, and uh, they had their ideas and uh, they had all these uh, different scholars and everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got an idea about what this means and what that means. But listen, if we fail to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all of this, and that's what we're going to see here in Daniel 7 and verse 9. I watched until thrones were put into place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued, and it came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open and I watched them. Uh, uh, be, uh, I watched them because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verse 12, and for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now this description is very much like the vision that John saw of the, of the Lord in the book of the Revelation. Revelation 1, starting at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now listen to the description, very similar. His head and hair were, like, uh, were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And it goes on in other places in the book of the Revelation, to describe uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes down toward the end especially, 
And we see not only the heavenly city, but we see the Lord sitting upon his throne. Now in verse 9, when the thrones were put in place, refers to the thrones of the ten kings that will be reigning with the little horn at the time of this judgment. Note that they will be put into place. God's uh, 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 justice, God's uh, uh, judgment, uh, it grinds uh, exceedingly slow, but exceedingly fine. And so uh, rest assured that God's judgment will be thorough and it will be just. You know, that's a big, big thing these days, talking about justice. Everybody's talking about justice. You know, but we, we got to have justice. Well, don't worry about it. God is going to come and uh, his justice will be right. It will be fair. And notice then, this is actually God the Father turning over judgment to God the Son. Some have made a big, big deal about the fact that, that to, it, it, the Ancient of Days here is God the Father. It can't be God the Son, it's God the Father. Well, you know, they're all one and the same. So, uh, it, and it's very clear. It's kind of like in the book of Psalms when it says, my, uh, the, the Lord spoke unto my Lord, said unto my Lord. You know, it's, it's the same, same idea here. We're talking about God the Ancient of Days. And notice in John chapter 5, uh, verse 22, it says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life. And that shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear him will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son to have life in himself, and it's given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So we see, the, first of all, the four winds. We see then the vision, secondly, of the Ancient of Days. And then lastly, we see the four beasts. Now bear with me real quickly here. We're just going to, uh, just, uh, we've already kind of talked and give the overview. So we're going to just look uh, just at a few details on the four beasts. As we said earlier, it reveals more detail about the four world kingdoms. And the emphasis, however, is on the last days, the revived Roman Empire. It gives us more information there than in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so uh, the, also the gates and the, uh, well, well, let's see. Uh, notice Daniel, first of all, was grieved in his spirit in verse 15 as he experienced this vision, especially uh, the fourth beast. And we'll see why in just a few moments. The first beast, a lion with eagle's wings. Now, throughout history, the lion has been a symbol for royal power. For example, King Solomon had 12 lion monuments uh, 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 as an entrance to his throne, leading up to his throne. And also the gates of the royal palaces were guarded by statues of winged lions. And throughout scriptures, we see the lion and the eagle as symbols of Babylon. Then the second beast, uh, see how quickly we're running through these? The second beast resembles a bear, an animal of formidable strength. This represents the Medio Persian Empire. And we know from the Bible and from history that the Medio Persian Empire was strong and fierce. The bear may be strong, but it's not cunning and graceful as the lion was. And so Daniel also observed that the bear was lopsided, verse 5. This is quite interesting, but if you've ever been in the woods, and uh, I was in the, uh, uh, the Catskill Mountains back a few years ago, and I used to love to go hiking, and I would follow these mountain streams up to their, uh, where, where they bubbled up out of the ground. And I love to find that. And there were seven different lakes up there in the Catskills that would uh, they feed uh, New York City with the, uh, the water. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're uh, reservoirs. 
And you can't even put a, you can put a boat in there, but you can't put a boat with a motor. <laughs> and you have to be very, very careful. And they have cameras everywhere and they watch you. They have security everywhere that watch, because this is the water system for the whole uh, area there of New York City. And so I, I would go into, and all this is just pure mountain water that uh, comes and bubbles up out of the ground and forms these streams. And I would get in these streams and go upstream until I began to see them going up, uh, bubbling up out of the water. Well, uh, I used to do that quite often, and I was there this last time. Well, it's been several years ago, and uh, I got a call on my cell phone saying, you better get out of there. They just saw a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and these aren't just bears that you can just sit there and say, oh, they're cute, you know, they're nice little bears, you know. Uh, these are bears that if you are confronted with one of them in the middle of a of the woods in the stream, uh, it could do some damage to you. They they have great big gold claws and they uh, only one swipe and they could wipe you out. So so uh, they said you you better get out of there. They just saw a bear. And if you've ever seen a bear walking, they, they don't walk straight, upright, you know, straight. They, they lumber around like this. Well, that's what he says in verse 5. It was raised up on one side. And apparently the union between the Medes and the Persians was lopsided. It wasn't an equal one. And so the Persians were greater and stronger than the Medes and eventually absorbed them into Persian culture and the political system. And so uh, this is very indicative. Now, when this was spoken, when this was seen, this was long before the Medo-Persian Empire ever took over. And so it was showing the characteristics of this particular empire uh, that uh, we know by history now, not just by biblical history, but by uh, human history, we know that this was the case. And so it, it, uh, it uh, uh, solidifies it and uh, verifies it in our minds. Then the third beast Daniel saw was the winged leopard, and this symbolized the Greek Empire. Just think about the Greek Empire, and, and a leopard uh, would, would uh, kind of uh, flow right along with that. John Walvoord writes, the leopard is in contrast to the lion, the first beast, it's less grand and majestic, but it's swifter and much feared as an animal of prey in Old Testament times. The swiftness of the leopard makes it the standard of co comparison in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 8, where the horses of the Chaldeans are described as swifter than leopards. Leopards characteristically would lie in wait for their prey and then pounce upon their victims with great speed and agility. The impression of the great speed inherent to the leopard is further enhanced by the presence of the four wings on its back with the swiftness of a leopard. Now, with the swiftness of the leopard, Alexander the Great conquered most of the civilized world, and he did it so quickly. In fact, there, there's a saying that goes, I don't know if it's true, but they say that Alexander the Great, he was uh, found just uh, wringing his hands and he was uh, depressed, and they said, well, well, men, you've conquered everything. He said, that's the problem. He says, there's, there's no more uh, kingdoms to conquer. There's nothing else to do. And so uh, we, we find that, that so the, the lightning character of its conquest is without precedent in the ancient world and is fully keeping with the image of speed. And once again, this was all before it took place, and it's pictured in this image. And then the fourth beast was dreadful and not compared to any particular animal. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, it says, And after this I saw in the night visions, behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, we already read that the very first, but I wanted to read it again because we see here 
that uh, we're talking about over 2,000 years of human history, the, the Roman Empire, and not only as a formal empire, but then later on as it begins to, it, it was actually overrun but, or overtaken, but, but, um, or dissipated rather, but now we find that uh, still uh, the, the Roman Empire will be revived. Now, a lot of people got all excited when the United Nations, the ten uh, nations came together uh, at first, and then there's been some that's dropped out and others that's been, uh, you know, all this, that, and the other. But, but still, we understand there are ten uh, different horns here, and then the little horn will come up. And notice uh, the iron teeth of this fourth beast identifies it with the iron legs of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw. The ten horns corresponded to the ten toes. As we continue on Daniel, we saw uh, in the New Testament, also in the New Testament, especially Revelation, we begin to see all these things more clearly. We, the, the image begins to come together. We begin to understand uh, what's going to happen in the latter days and in these prophecies. And so we, 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 it gives us an understanding. Now, what's interesting about this is we have the advantage of looking back on human history. And we see these things coming up to a certain point, And then we find that the th rest of this is prophesied as future. And because everything came true in the past, remember we talked about how that a, a prophet in the Old Testament or in the Bible, a prophet was correct 100% of the time. We're not talking about some kind of uh, soothsayer or some kind of a palm reader or something like that that gives out general information and they might be right a part of the time or some of the time. We're talking about a person that, that, that was a, a, a considered a Bible prophet was correct 100% of the time and such was Daniel. 100%. There's nothing here that you could look at and say when Daniel's vision, oh, that was wrong. That was, that, that was not, not right. That's not what happened. You can look at it and say, hey, that's exactly what took place. And now, yet he's going to show the future. And that's what's going to take place when this little horn comes up and is speaking pompous words and, and uh, eloquent speeches. It's going to be the Antichrist. And he's going to present the, the great lie. Uh, and uh, people's going to believe that lie. And you can look today in and, and so many different ways and see how uh, people will surely believe the lie. There's, there's certain things that uh, uh, people just will believe. It's uh, their perspective. I, I uh, uh, caution my mom many times because she, uh, she, she, somebody will call her on the telephone and uh, uh, try to sell her something or scam her in some way, and she will actually believe what they're saying. And uh, I cautioned her about that, but you see, it's a state of mind. We believe certain things, and we have to uh, put up a guard there and understand that, and people will be ready to receive the lie uh, of the Antichrist. And you think, well, wait a minute, when, when the Christ comes and returns and and uh, they, they see all these things uh, take place. Won't they just run to the Bible and say, oh, here, here's what's happening. No, they'll believe the lie instead. They won't believe the word of God. They'll believe the lie. And so we have to understand that that's going to take place. And so uh, with, with that in mind, we, we approach the, these days in which we live with an understanding that, yes, this is the way things are going to uh, come out in the end. And so with that, it's, it's kind of exciting. It's kind of scary in a way, but it's kind of exciting to know the fact that we're living in this time. And we get to see all these things happening. And you say, well, it, it drives me crazy, you know. Yes, it does. It, it's unnerving. At the same time, it's also exciting because uh, we're living in what they say unprecedented times. Amen. Everything is unprecedented. Amen. But, but it is. It is indeed uh, unprecedented. We live in times now that we never dreamed we'd see ever in, in, this, uh, in these United States and in this world. 
We never dreamed that we would see things develop as they are uh, as we speak. And so uh, we, we understand the times in which we live. We understand the prophecies. And we look to God, not to government, but we look to God for the answer. Let's all stand together. The main thing is to know that you're saved, that you've uh, accepted Christ as your personal Savior, that uh, you have the, the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you. You're trusting in Him. Uh, and that's the main thing. Let's pray. Dear Father, we ask, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, that you settle our minds. Lord, that we may know and understand that, God, you are in control, even though it may seem like you're not. We might seem like uh, that Satan uh, is in control. And Lord, for a while, Lord, you have uh, turned the things over to Satan for, uh, because he's the God of this world. But Lord, we also understand that, God, you have a plan and your plan will not uh, be uh, thwarted. Your plan will not be uh, uh, detoured in any way or form or fashion. And God, these things are true they were true when Daniel uh, 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 spoke them and wrote them. They're true today as we look back upon these things. And Lord, as we look forward to the future, we see that the, the prophecies that uh, Daniel's going to speak about, Lord, are all uh, before us and understanding that, God, you're in control of this world. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. What number? Number 320, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's the only place to turn is upon, to the Lord Jesus Christ while we sing together. <clears throat> oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in this wonderful face And the things of earth will grow dim in the light of his glory and grace remember now uh, tonight we'll have the video of uh, the 25 different signs of the times it's quite interesting it's not sensational it's not anything that uh, it's just what the Bible says amen it's not anything that's way out there but it's quite interesting and uh, also, I uh, want to apologize for wearing my readers today. I have a special set of glasses that I use just for pulpit purposes. It's measured that way. As a, a, a stand at a podium, it's, it's, it's got that place to, uh, where I can read. <laughs> and for some reason, I lost my glasses. So if you see a pair of glasses... Uh, somewhere, let me know because it, that I, I just use them at church. Is all I use them for, and uh, and I apologize. I hate it when somebody's looking at me uh, with their uh, uh, over their glasses. It just bugs me to death. But I didn't have a choice at this point. Amen. So I appreciate your your patience with me, and I will get me some more glasses in the next week or two. So, but uh, if you find my glasses. I, d I had them at church last week, and I haven't seen them since. So I don't know what happened to them. There's a pair on the table out here. Uh, is it? We was up here this week, and a pair laid on the desk. Oh, well, it must be mine, but I don't see them anymore. They might, they might still be there. I'll, I'll look and see. Well, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll look and see. All right, well, let's, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer at this time. And uh, we're thankful that, uh, for your uh, coming to church. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the message that we've had. And, and Lord, we see that uh, you knew what was going to happen uh, 500 years before it happened. And Lord, we thank you for your direction. 
and Lord, you are in control, and we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for even in our time, we know that you are still in control, even though things may look different. So Lord, we just pray that you would help us to continually trust in you and walk with you day by day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.